Jacques René Ebert French Eb the 15th of November 1757 to the 24th of March 1794 was a French journalist and the founder and editor of the extreme radical newspaper Le Père de Chesney during the French Revolution He was a leader of the French Revolution and had thousands of followers as the Ebertists French Ebertistes He himself is sometimes called Per de Chesney after his newspaper Topic Early life He was born on 15 November 1757 at Alencon, to Goldsmith, former trial judge, and deputy consul Jacques Ebert died 1766 and Marguerite Bunech de Haudry Jacques René Ebert studied law at the College of Alencon and went into practice as a clerk in a solicitor of Alencon, at which time he was ruined by a lawsuit against a Dr. Clouet. Ebert fled first to Rouen and then to Paris. For a while he passed through a difficult financial time and lived through the support of a hairdresser in Rue des Neuers. There he found work in a theatre, La République, where he wrote plays in his spare time, but these were never produced. He was fired for stealing. He then entered the service of a doctor. It is said he lived through expediency and scams. In 1789, he began his writing with a pamphlet. La lantern magique ou la fléau des aristocrates, magic lantern or scourge of aristocrats. He published a few booklets. In 1790, he attracted attention through a pamphlet he published and became a prominent member of the club of the Cordeliers in 1791. Topic: <laughs> Per de Chesney. From 1790 until his death in 1794 Ebert became a voice for the working class of Paris through his highly successful and influential journal, Le Père de Chesney. In his journal, Ebert assumed the voice of a patriotic sans-culotte named Père de Chesney and would write first-person narratives in which Père de Chesney would often relay fictitious conversations that he had with the French monarchs or government officials. These stories encouraged violent behaviors and utilized foul language, however, Per de Chesney's stories were also witty, reflective, and resonated deeply with Parisian workers. Street hawkers would yell, Il est bougrement en colère aujourd'hui le Per de Chesney, Father de Chesney is very angry today. Although Ebert did not create the image of the Per de Chesney, his use of the character helped to transform the symbolic image of Per de Chesney from that of a comical stove merchant into a patriotic role model for the sans culottes in part. Ebert's use of Per de Chesney as a revolutionary symbol can be seen by his appearance as a bristly old man who was portrayed as smoking a pipe and wearing a Phrygian cap. Because he reflected both the speech and dressing style of his audience, his readers listened to and followed his message. The French linguist and historian Ferdinand Bruno called Ebert the Homer of filth because of his ability to use common language to appeal to general audiences in addition, Per de Chesney's appearance played into the tensions of the revolution through the sharp contrast of his clothing and portrayal as a laborer against the crown and aristocracy's formal attire. Ebert was not the only writer during the French Revolution to use the image of Per de Chesney nor was he the only author in the period to adopt foul language as a way of appealing to the working class. Another writer at the time, Le Maire, also wrote a newspaper entitled Per Duchesne although he spelled it differently than Ebert from September 1790 until May 1792 in which he assumed the voice of a «moderate patriot» who wanted to conserve the relationship between the king and the nation. Le Maire's character also used a slew of profanities and would address France's military. Ebert's paper, however, became far more popular. In part, this was due to the Paris Commune deciding to buy his papers and distribute them to the French military for distribution to soldiers in training. For example, starting in 1792 the Paris Commune and the ministers of war Jean-Nicolas Patch and, later, Jean-Baptiste Noël Bouchot bought several thousand copies of Le Père de Chesney which were distributed free to the public and troops. This happened again in May and June 1793 when the minister of war bought copies of newspapers in order to enlighten and animate their patriotism. It is estimated that Ebert received 205,000 livres from this purchase. Ebert's political commentary between 1790 and 1793 focused on the lavish excesses of the monarchy. Initially, from 1790 and into 1792, Le Père de Chesney supported a constitutional monarchy and was even favorable towards King Louis XVI and the opinions of the Marquis de Lafayette. 
His violent attacks of the period were aimed at Jean Cyphern Mori, a great defender of papal authority and the main opponent of the civil constitution of the clergy. Although the character of Per Duchesne supported a constitutional monarchy, he was always highly critical of Marie Antoinette. Knowing that the Queen was an easy target for ridicule after the diamond necklace affair, she became a consistent target in the paper as a scapegoat for many of France's political problems. By identifying Marie Antoinette's lavish excesses and alleged sexuality as the core of the monarchy's problems, Ebert's articles suggested that, if Marie Antoinette would change her ways and renounce aristocratic excesses, then the monarchy could be saved and the Queen could return to the goodwill of the people. Despite his view that the monarchy could be restored, Ebert was skeptical of the Queen's willingness to do so and often characterized her as an evil enemy of the people by referring to Marie Antoinette as Madame Vito and even addressing Louis XVI as drunken and lazy, a cuckolded pig. Initially, Ebert was trying to not only educate his readers about the Queen, but also awaken her to how she was viewed by the French public. Many of the conversations that Per Duchesne carries with her in the newspaper are attempts at either showcasing her supposed nymphomania or attempts to beg her to repent and reverse her wicked ways. With the king's failed flight to Varennes his tone significantly hardened. Many writers and journalists at the time were greatly influenced by the proclamation of martial law on 21 October 1789. It invoked various questions and patterns of revolutionary thinking and inspired various forms of writing such as Le Per de Chesney. The law prompted multiple interpretations all of which led to what became essential revolutionary ideals. In his newspaper, Le Per de Chesney, Ebert did not use himself as the prime example of the revolution. He used a mythical character called the Per de Chesney to be able to relay his message in a more subtle way. He was already well known by the people of Paris and only wanted his message to be received directly and clearly by his followers and not his enemies. Per de Chesney was a very strong, outspoken character with extremely high emotions. He constantly felt great anger but also would experience great happiness. He was never afraid to fully display exactly how he was feeling. He would constantly use foul language and other harsh words to express himself. Revolutionary role Ebert agreed with most of the ideals of the radical Montagnard faction, however, he was not a member of the faction. On 17 July 1791, Ebert was at the Champ de Mars to sign a petition to demand the removal of King Louis XVI and was caught up in the subsequent Champ de Mars massacre by troops under Lafayette. This put him in the revolutionary mindset, and the Le Per de Chesney adopted a sloppier style to better appeal to the masses. Le Per de Chesney began to attack Lafayette, Mirabeau, and Bailly. Following Louis's failed flight to Varennes he began to attack both Louis and Pope Pius VI as well. Ebert met his future wife Marie Goupil born 1756, a 37-year-old former nun who had left convent life at the Sisters of Providence Convent at Rue Saint-Honoré. Marie's passport from this time shows regular use. They married on 7 February 1792, and had a daughter, Virginia Scipione Ebert the 7th of February 1793 to 13 July 1830. During this time, Ebert had a luxurious, bourgeois life. He entertained Jean-Nicolas Patch, the mayor of Paris and minister of war, for weeks, as well as other influential men, and liked to dress elegantly and surround himself with beautiful objects as beautiful tapestries an attitude that can be contrasted to that of Pierre Gaspard Chamet. Where he got the financial resources to support his lifestyle is unclear, however, there are Jean-Nicolas Patch's commissions to print thousands of issues of Le Per de Chesney and his relationship to Delany Dangers, mistress and wife of Andrés Maria de Guzman. As a member of Cordelier's club, he had a seat in the revolutionary Paris Commune where on 9 and 10 August, 1792 he was sent to the Bonne Nouvelle section of Paris. As a public journalist, he supported the September massacres. On the 22nd of December 1792, he was appointed the second substitute of the procureur of the commune, and through to August 1793 supported the attacks against the Girondin faction. In April to May 1793 he, along with Merritt and others, violently attacked Girondins. In February 1793, he voted with fellow bourgeois Ebertists against the Maximum Price Act, a price ceiling on grain, on the grounds it would cause hoarding and stir resentment. 
On 20 May 1793 the moderate majority of the National Convention formed the Special Commission of Twelve, which was designed to investigate and prosecute conspirators. At the urging of the Twelve on 24 May 1793 he was arrested. However, Ebert had been warned in time, and, with the support of the sans culottes, the National Convention was forced to order his release three days later. Reign of Terror Between 31 May to 2 June 1793, Paris sections—encouraged by the enragés, enraged ones, Jacques Roux and Jacques Ebert, protested outside the convention, calling for administrative and political purges, a low fixed price for bread, and a limitation of the electoral franchise to sans culottes alone. With the backing of the National Guard, they convinced the convention to arrest 31 Girondin leaders, including Jacques-Pierre Brousseau. Following these arrests, the Jacobins gained control of the Committee of Public Safety on 10 June, installing the revolutionary dictatorship. On 13 July the assassination of Jean-Paul Merritt, a Jacobin leader and journalist known for his aggressive rhetoric, by Charlotte Corday, a Girondin, resulted in further increase of Jacobin political influence. Georges Danton, the leader of August 1792 uprising against the king, was removed from the committee. On 27 July, Maximilien Robespierre, known as the Incorruptible, made his entrance, and quickly became the most influential member of the committee as it moved to take radical measures against the revolution's domestic and foreign enemies. Meanwhile, on 24 June, the convention adopted the first republican constitution of France, the French Constitution of 1793. It was ratified by public referendum, but never put into force. Like other laws, it was indefinitely suspended by the decree of October that the government of France would be revolutionary until the peace. The eventual constitution under the Directory was quite different. Facing local revolts, foreign invasions, and riots in both the east and west of the country, the most urgent government business was the war. On 17 August, the convention voted for general conscription, the levée en masse, which mobilized all citizens to serve as soldiers or suppliers in the war effort. On 5 September the convention institutionalized the reign of terror, systematic and lethal repression of perceived enemies within the country. The result was policy through which the state used violent repression to crush resistance to the government. The guillotine became the symbol of a string of executions. Louis XVI had already been guillotined before the start of the terror. Marie Antoinette, the Girondins, Philippe Egalité, Madame Roland, and many others lost their lives under its blade. The Revolutionary Tribunal summarily condemned thousands of people to death by the guillotine, while mobs beat other victims to death. While some people engaged in active resistance to the revolution were arrested and executed, many other people were victimized merely for their political opinions or actions, often for little reason beyond mere suspicion, or because some others had a stake in getting rid of them. Most of the victims received an unceremonious trip to the guillotine in an open wooden cart the tumbrel. Loaded onto these carts, the victims would proceed through throngs of jeering men and women. The victims of the Reign of Terror are estimated to be about 27,000, of which approximately 17,000 were officially executed and about 10,000 died in prison or without trial. Among people who were condemned by the revolutionary tribunals, about 8% were aristocrats, 6% clergy, 25% middle class, and two-thirds were workers or peasants accused of hoarding, evading the draft, desertion, rebellion, and other purported minimal crimes. Of these social groupings, the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church suffered proportionately the greatest loss. Dechristianization Dechristianization was a movement that took hold during the French Revolution in which advocates believed that, in order to pursue a secular society, they had to reject the superstitions of the old regime and, as an extension, Catholicism. The trend toward secularization had already begun to take hold throughout France during the 18th century, however, between September 1793 and August 1794, French politicians began discussing and embracing notions of «radical dechristianization». While Robespierre advocated for the right to religion and believed that aggressively pursuing dechristianization would spur widespread revolts throughout rural France, Ebert and his followers, the Ebertists, wanted to spontaneously and violently overhaul religion. 
The program of dechristianization waged against Catholicism, and eventually against all forms of Christianity, included the deportation of clergy and the condemnation of many of them to death, the closing of churches, the institution of revolutionary and civic cults, the large-scale destruction of religious monuments, the outlawing of public and private worship and religious education, forced marriages of the clergy and forced abjurement of their priesthood. On 21 October 1793 a law was passed which made all suspected priests and all persons who harbored them liable to death on sight. On 10 November 1793, dechristianization reached what many historians consider the climax of the movement when the Ebertists moved the first celebration of the Festival of Reason, a civic festival celebrating the Goddess of Reason, from the Circus of the Palais Royal to the Cathedral of Notre Dame and reclaimed the cathedral as a «Temple of Reason». On 7 June Robespierre, who had previously condemned the cult of reason, advocated a new state religion and recommended that the convention acknowledge the existence of God. On the next day, the worship of the deistic supreme being was inaugurated as an official aspect of the revolution. Compared with Ebert's somewhat popular festivals, this austere new religion of virtue was received with signs of hostility by the Parisian public. Clash with Robespierre, arrest, conviction, and execution After successfully attacking the Girondins, he continued to attack others whom he viewed as too moderate including Danton, Philippot, and Robespierre in the fall of 1793. The government, with support from the Jacobins, was exasperated and finally decided to strike on the night of 13 March 1794, despite the reluctance of Barrieri de Vuzic, Collet d'Herbois and Biot Varenne. The order was to arrest the leaders of the Ebertists, these included individuals in the war ministry and others. In the Revolutionary Tribunal, Ebert was treated very differently from Danton, more like a thief than a conspirator, his earlier scams were brought to light and criticized. He was sentenced to death with his co-defendants on the third day of deliberations. Their execution by guillotine took place on 24 March 1794. Ebert fainted several times on the way to the guillotine, and screamed hysterically when he was placed under the blade. Ebert's executioners amused the crowd by adjusting the guillotine so that its blade stopped inches above his neck. Only on the fourth attempt was the execution carried out. His corpse was disposed of in the Madeleine Cemetery. His widow was executed 20 days later on 13 April 1794. Her corpse was disposed of in the Arancis Cemetery. Influence It is difficult to ascertain the extent to which Ebert's publication Le Per de Chesney impacted the outcomes of political events between 1790 and 1794. French revolutionary historians such as Jean-Paul Bertrand, Jeremy D. Popkin, and William J. Murray each investigated French revolutionary press history and determined that while the newspapers and magazines that one read during the revolution may have influenced their political leanings, it did not necessarily create their political leanings. One's class, for example, could be a significant determinant in directing and influencing one's political decisions. Therefore, Ebert's writings certainly influenced his audience to some extent, but that does not mean that it changed the political outcomes of the French Revolution. That being said, his wide readership and voice throughout the Revolution means that he was a significant public figure and Le Per de Chesney's ability to influence the general population of France was indeed notable. <laughs> Gallery <laughs>